Queen made a little PowerPoint for you guys today. Do, do, do. Okay, can everyone see that? Awesome, got thumbs up. So today we're gonna to be talking about the hamstrings. If you haven't been to this class yet, this class is about um, yin yoga as kind of a complement to your daily life. We kind of pepper in this knowledge of anatomy. So when you're doing these poses and in these compressions and in these stretches, you kind of have an understanding or can think about in, in the meditation that it is to be in a strange shape. You can think about what your body's doing and let that be kind of part of the, the meditative aspect of it. Uh, so today we wanted to focus on the hamstrings um, because it's a kind of a running focus class. And I feel like there's this mystery among the hamstrings because like people say it a lot, like, oh, my hamstrings are tight or this is a great hamstring stretch, but like, what are they? Um, so the hamstrings are actually a group of muscles. There are three muscles, the semi-tendinosis, the semimembranosus and the biceps femoris, which has two heads, a short head and a long head. Um, and this is kind of the three of them. So this is them all together. You can see they take up most of the leg. That's your pelvis and your hip bone right there. That's your femur and your thigh bone, and that is your knee. So the hamstrings, they originate at the ischial, let's see if all oh, worked. <laughs> they originate at the ischial tuberosity of the pelvis where the butt ends and the thigh begins, kind of that little line is where the hamstrings begin. And then they cross over the entire thigh and connect onto both sides of the knee. Um, so important to note there that they're crossing over two joint structures. Therefore, this muscle always works with these two joints. Um, the, I think what's also kind of interesting is um, the action of the hamstring is to basically take the leg back and bend the knee. So in this motion, my hamstrings are actually shortened because when a muscle is in contraction, the two ends of it right here and right here are moving closer together. And when you stretch them, they're moving farther apart. So that's kind of a good way is to like when, how, when you use a muscle, you stretch it by doing the opposite. So we're gonna stretch the hamstring by bringing it forward and then unbending that knee. Um, and when you kind of think about the hamstring, here's a chair. If the hamstring is short and contracted when we go like this, that means when we go like this, it's stretching. And that means when we sit, and have our legs out like this, or even our legs like this, technically, we're stretching our hamstring. It's not like actively stretching as we do in like, let's say a yoga pose, or let's say, um, you know, like a cat, uh, cat stretch or something, but like we are technically, it's not shortened, it's stretched. Um, and I think here in the West, especially, we, we pay a lot of attention to this backside of our body and what's going on in the back and things like that. Um, and we are using those muscles all the time to do things like sitting. And um, yeah, so when you sit, you are technically kind of giving a little stretch to your hamstrings. Why does that feel so good to stretch them is because we never fully give them their full stretch. So when we do go into these poses like, you know, 
like we'll do today, which is the half shoelace and bending over. It feels good because we're stretching all of that muscle rather than when we sit, we're only kind of stretching this top part of the muscle per se. So when we kind of move through our day and think about, or move through our yoga postures and think about what our hamstring is doing at the moment, um, a lot of the times we are putting it into a full stretch. Um, and that's what's giving us this kind of satisfaction for um, the satisfaction of feeling, I guess, the stretch. Um, and so in today's sequence, we're going to do a couple of poses, lot, quite a few poses that stretch the hamstrings. So like I said earlier, the half shoelace with the forward fold, the half straddle with the forward fold. Child's pose, because you are in flexion of the hip, you're still stretching your hamstring a little bit. And then when we're moving pose as well, also is flexion of the hip, um, which is a little stretch to the hamstrings. So they might not be, these last two might not be specific to stretching the hamstring, but you are still giving the hamstring a small stretch, especially to this kind of top part of the hamstring that connects right at the pelvis. Um, a fun fact about the hamstring, the reason it's called the hamstring is because these two tendons right here, when pigs back in the day were butchered, I guess not back in the day, but pigs have been butchered forever, but like when pigs were sent to the butcher, the uh, butcher would hang the ham of the pig, which is the thigh of the pig, um, by its hamstrings, by these two tendons that we have similar to the pig that attach um, at the lower leg. So these are the kind of hamstrings, and this could per se be our ham. Um, but that's why they got their name, the hamstrings. But really, they are these three separate muscles. And another thing we can do, I don't know if I'm running over time here, is if you even touch your own sides of your knee. So if you kind of, one way to feel the hamstrings that are attaching at the knee is you bring, let's have our right foot out. Let's bring our left foot behind the, um, boop, boop, boop. Let's yeah, bring our left foot behind the right foot. And then you kind of grab right below this soft part of the knee where it bends. So you're kind of grabbing right below it going down the leg, but right here. You can only already kind of feel there's these ropey kind of structures. But then if you were to kick this right foot in, to the left foot, you can really feel them fire off. So you can relax them again, and then kick them back in, and you really feel these ropey things on the side. And those are the tendons coming off of your hamstrings. And I feel like it's interesting when you, because you could kind of almost grab the thing, and the hamstrings seem so much less intimidating when you can like grab them with your hand. Um, because they're just there and they're in the palm of your hand. Um, but they do this big movement and they stabilize the knee. They stabilize the pelvis. They help us propel forward when we move. Um, so they're this big, big, very important muscle. And um, yeah, it's just fun to give a little attention to this this hamstring group all right i'm going to stop sharing my screen and then we're going to go into practice so our first pose um oh our first pose is the toe stretch so i'm going to take us there for about two minutes 
So what we're going to do just to start off, it's going to start the practice off with a little bit of heat and then we're going to really wind down. But it's the yogi toe squat. So it's going to look kind of like right here, like that. Toes pointed and you're going to take your hips and kind of let gravity fall onto them. Now, if this is too intense, you can take the pose from up here and just have the stretch in the back of the foot. But if you're a runner, you know that this pose, uh, that the bottom of the feet really get a workout. And we're only gonna be here for a short time because this pose can be intense. And they say the yogi toe hold, if you do it every day for at least a minute, your entire posture will change and the way you walk will change. But it is intense and that's because maybe we don't always pay attention to our foot. So we're not gonna be here much longer. We've only got about 20 more seconds in this hold. It's just a minute. but they don't call it the screaming toe for, for nothing. All right, you could come out of that, tuck the toes in and maybe go for an ankle stretch, leaning back, doing the reverse. And now that we've woken our feet up, we can wind back down and I'll go ahead and ping Greta. Cool, oh my God, that one always gets me. It's so hard, but it also like my feet after feel so good. All right, um, let's go ahead and lay down onto our backs, coming into Supta Baddha Konasana, bringing the soles of the feet to touch, laying on the back. You're feeling, um, if it feels like too much, the legs open like that, you can always support the knees with a block or if you've got pillows, you can put them under the knees, bringing the soles of the feet to touch. And in a yin practice, we wanna have a lot of distance between our pelvis and our ankles. Not so much like a yin practice where the heels might be super close to the pelvis and then you're laying down on the back. And I'm going to talk a little bit about yin, break it down for us before we get into practice. And I first like to talk about the energetic qualities associated with yin. And yin is more allowing. Yin is oftentimes associated with night. It is going to be more of an earth quality, it's going to be denser, it's also going to be less dynamic, and all these things are the opposite of the yang or the yang qualities, which is going to be bright and movement and intensity, and the two forces really complement each other, and they're both, uh, they require each other to exist. And in the practice, those energetic qualities also like resting and regenerating, um, inviting those into your practice right now and using each of the poses, especially when we're practicing in quiet, to really try to cultivate those tendencies. Um, and then in terms of anatomy and physiology, um, Veronica does such an awesome job about talking about the body. And in yoga, I feel like it's just the best time to learn about anatomy because um, you're literally experiencing what what it feels like in your body instead of like looking at a chart or like a diagram or like some sort of like online 3D tool. And there are three tattvas, three truths or pillars to this practice. And the first is to find your gentle edge. We already found our gentle edge when we set up this pose. Um, sometimes it's called pertinent depth. And we want it to be like 
anywhere between like 50 and 70% of your range of motion because we wanna be able to sustain the pose for time. So you may like dive in and get in, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. And then you're there for like a minute and you're like, there is no way I can do this for five minutes. So you need to kind of pull the edge back or maybe add a block or add a pillow. So just like being honest with yourself, okay, like finding my edge and can I sustain this for time? So the first tapa is find the gentle edge. The second is to be still and stillness is for me um it can be actually really hard especially if you haven't done this before it's like why are you like why do i have to be still like i want to move like that's just kind of like a name my personality and if my body's not moving then my mind might race so there's definitely like there can be a challenge to this other times i feel like you can just kind of like melt into it like you're already exhausted this is exactly what you need so being still, and there are two reasons in which you would move. Um, if you're invited to go deeper, sometimes after the muscles have become less dynamic and they are more passive, you're invited to go deeper. So follow your edge, um, you can take out a block, you can remove a pillow, go deeper. And then the other reason you would move is if you're in pain, we never want you experiencing any pain. And pain may be experienced as like a burning sensation, a stabbing sensation, we even want to avoid tingling because that can cause nerve damage. And then lastly, we hold for time. I keep track of time on my phone on the timer. I give a halfway mark and a final minute. And this is just so you can more easily surrender into the pose and be like, okay, I'm at the halfway mark. Maybe I'll like, it's just kind of a good point to like check in with yourself. And then final minute, it's like, cool, just 60 seconds left. And that is also like time is the magic in this in this practice, not so much the intensity. And I guess the only other things I'll say, when you move out of the poses, especially some of the longer holds, like you may want to just like moan or like sigh because it's going to feel like a lot after the long holds. Like let that be a release moment, enjoy those moments. And also in this practice, um, it kind of, it, it's kind of, you're riding the edge and you're experiencing, you may experience discomfort in the body. And we don't want to experience pain, but like that discomfort we do, you kind of, kind of can be like a dull achy sensation going on in the joints. That is definitely a part of the practice. And just being in the body and treating yourself with kindness and compassion, even if those words, I know I hear those words and my instant reaction is just like, I don't want to be, I like want to roll my eyes. I think that's because there's a lot of connotations with those words that are kind of inauthentic to their essence, but like distilling that down to what those words really mean to you and trying to turn towards your practice with that energy. Um, I think that's, I think that's enough for today. You can always talk about more, but part of this practice is really to be in that stillness and to create that space for yourself to reflect and to be in the quiet. Okay, gently over the next few breaths, begin to close the knees like you would close a book and do any counter pose the body is craving. I know oftentimes I kind of want to hug my knees towards my chest roll around the flat part of my back. Maybe you want to kick one leg out, the other leg out. Like really whatever your body is craving, like that is the movement you should be doing. I'll always give some options if you're like, I don't know. But oftentimes the body is going to feed you with the best information. And then we'll continue lying on the back. And next pose is one of the ones Veronica talked about the end of class, wind removing pose which is basically just a cannonball shape. The knees are in towards your chest. And you can loosely wrap the arms around the shins, bringing the knees close to you. And in this pose, um, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the mechanics of breathing. On our runner's class, um, we have a note next to this pose and intercostal muscles tied to the lungs um, strengthen and also contribute to our breath. And I have this really amazing anatomy book by Alice Walker 
And I thought um, you can have your arms around your shins or even if you wanted to place your arms on top of your rib cage right now, because the intercostal muscles are the muscles in between your rib cage. And I'm gonna read kind of what she has written on breathing in and breathing out. And as you breathe in and breathe out, maybe just noticing the movement of your body going. And we're not gonna be in this pose for super long. So breathing in. The lungs, air is drawn into the lungs as the chest cavity expands. The diaphragm, which um, it kind of looks like a dome. The diaphragm contracts and flattens to draw chest cavity downwards. So the diaphragm moves downwards in contraction and it moves down up to four inches when the lungs expand. The ribs, when you're breathing in, they tilt upward in response to the muscle contraction. We're at the halfway point. And then the, in, the intercostal muscles, they also contract and tilt upward when you breathe in. So that's what's going on when you breathe in. The lungs are expanding, diaphragm is moving down four inches. The ribs and the intercostal muscles are moving up. So maybe if you can feel that movement going on right now in your own body. And then when you breathe out, of course, the lungs deflate. The diaphragm act actually relaxes and it bounces back up to its regular position. And intercostal muscles and the ribs tilt downward and inward. You may also even feel the, the obliques in there as well. Um, they kind of shorten and contract when we breathe out also. So just noticing that going on in your own body and Knowing the word intercostal muscle isn't necessarily to me actually that important, but being able to understand the mechanism of how I'm breathing, I think is really empowering. So taking that with you into your practice. And this is um, the last 30 seconds here actually. You can gently release the legs down, let the arms fall to your sides. And choose how you would like to come to a seat. You can rock and roll up to seat. You can also choose if you'd like to roll over to the right or the left side and kind of enter in that direction, whatever feels the most natural for you. And then coming to a seat, we're gonna practice the half shoelace pose, which is the hamstring stretch of the year for me. So extend the, um, let's start with the right leg out long and then bring the left leg up and over the right leg. If you're feeling any intensity in your knee, you may wanna put a block in between the knee and the leg or you like a pillow or something. Otherwise, getting the left leg up and over the right leg, you can move the glutes out from underneath you. And inhale to find length in your spine. And then exhale to fold forward. And at this point, you may be like, ooh, I want to grab a pillow to support your chest. Maybe you want to double up the pillow. And then noticing once I fold forward, I can immediately feel like the muscles in the calf and also the hamstrings uh, being activated. I'm gonna go ahead and set our timer here. And if you add a prop and you're like, actually, I don't need it, you can always ditch the prop. And every practice is gonna be different depending on how much water you drink that day, depending on um, so many different factors. So dropping any expectations with what the pose should 
look like. There is no perfect form. And I'll leave us to practice in, in quiet. And if the mind does get kind of loud, maybe coming back to energetically focusing on your breath, thinking about the movement of your ribs, lungs, diaphragm, and the intercostal muscles. And this is the halfway mark. And this is the final minute. I'm noticing how much the sensation has changed in your body. At least for me, I feel it a lot more than I did the first minute. I'm honoring that sensation, knowing that it is meant to be experienced and it is a part of the process.
and gently begin to press the palms into the mats. Slowly lift the chest, torso, move up and out of the pose. You can unthread the left leg. I definitely kind of want to bounce my legs for a second. Um, you may want to take, you may want to kind of just press the pelvis up for a second or take this form of tabletop as a form of release. Definitely was feeling it in that last, in that last minute. And then we'll switch sides. And so this time we'll extend the left leg out long and bring the right leg over the left. And you may come to the side and you may realize it is completely different story than the other side. So if that's the case, just adjusting however it seems fit for you. Um, you may even want to sit up on something that would help the pelvic bowl tilt down. So like a block or like a thin bolster sometimes is really nice or like the, the yoga mat rolled up underneath you. So finding your edge on this side, adjusting what needs to be adjusted. And we'll do the other side as well. Really zeroing in on the hamstring in this stretch. Um, and since this is one of our longer holds, um, I wanted to share a little bit. So one of the energetic qualities associated with yin is this allowing. It's the yielding regenerative practice. And I've been reading this book by Lama Rod Owens called Love and Rage. And he talks about allowing in the book. And I, I love getting other people's perspectives on the thing. So I thought I would share a little bit from this to kind of access it. This is actually, he's talking about happiness in this, in this chapter. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from it. Um, I don't want to read too much. I'm just going to start. In my practice, happiness is this experience of contentment, connectedness, and balance. When I say happiness, I'm not necessarily referring to this euphoric experience. And I think oftentimes I'm like happiness or I hear the word bliss or joy. I'm like, hmm, like suspicious. Euphoria is what oftentimes people think of. And happiness doesn't mean we are forcing anything away. It is this profound and revolutionary practice of allowing and accepting. When I say allow, it doesn't mean condoning or celebrating what's in our mind. It means that there's already material there and how can I do the work of allowing it to be there? And when I do the work of allowing something to be there, then I begin to enter into relationship with what it is. I don't have to like what I'm allowing either, but I do have to let it be there. Often when people think about happiness, they think that happiness is an eradication of discomfort. Rather, it is holding of our discomfort in a spaciousness that makes it less likely for us to fixate on the discomfort and exaggerate in it. Practicing happiness means I am doing the work of trusting myself. Practicing Dharma and revolution is not fun or necessarily comfortable. It is complex and sometimes confusing. And then he goes on to talk about other things. So kind of just turning towards and allowing Right, right now, it may feel kind of fine, but in the last minute, just kind of allowing the experience to be there. Knowing that you're doing something really good for your connective tissue, for your muscles, your bones, ligaments, and joints. You're stressing and compressing them, helping with the regeneration of bone growth, preventing the shrink wrapping of your muscles through the stressing and compressing of the connective tissue and the fascia. This is exactly the halfway mark.
and this is the final minute. And you slowly begin to discern how you want to exit. And press the palms to the floor, slowly lifting your head, the torso. Move any props off to the side, unthread the legs, bounce them up and down. Do any counter movement the body is asking for, maybe flex and point your feet. And we're gonna stay in a seat and move in to um, go ahead and open up the legs and kind of creating tree legs and bringing the left foot into the inside seam of your right leg. And in yin, they call this half straddle. You may need to kind of pick up the glutes, situate yourselves, um, especially if you're looking to prevent sciatica, it can be nice to sit on, um, I've got a book back here and staying on the very edge of the book just helps my pelvic bowl tilt down. Um, so if that helps you as well, you can sit on something. And inhale, lift the chest, kind of find length in your spine. And then on an exhale, fold forward, bring the chest over your right leg, or close to thereabouts. You may want to add a block or a couple pillows, or maybe both. and relax into the pose. This is going to be three minutes, so it won't be as long as the other hold. By giving a chance to get into the adductors, which are the muscles that come right out of the pelvis. Following the edge, it recedes, taking your eye props when you need them, relaxing your jaw. I just found myself clenching my jaw. Maybe you hold tension in your eyebrows or your forehead. So kind of scanning the body and noticing if you could relax it even a bit more. And this is the halfway mark. And final minute.
And gently begin to lift your chest, pressing the hands into the mat. And come back up to a tall, neutral spine. Do any counter movement. The body is asking for, for some reason, I want to kind of shake my shoulders out, roll my ankle. And then go ahead and switch your legs. So this time the left leg is extended long and bringing the right foot into the inside seam of your left leg. You can remove the glutes out. So you're sitting on the ischial tuberosity, your sit bone. Inhale, find length in the spine. And then exhale, fold over the left leg. And this side for me feels way tighter. So just like knowing the body is really like not as symmetrical as I often think it is in my head. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm pretty symmetrical, but we tend to have a dominant side. And um, it may be from like a past habit or like an old job that we had that it's even like that. It may be a residual pattern, pattern left over from that. So just noticing what's going on. And in that pattern of awareness, noticing what's going on, not judging yourself for it either, either like suspending any criticisms on it. Um, it can be really easy to, when you're reflecting, to kind of fall into those narratives. So just kind of noticing, noticing what's going on, maybe getting curious about it. Feeling really brave, practicing that compassion. This is the halfway mark. And final minute. I'm just noticing sensations in the body. I just finally felt some release in my lower back. So it really does take time sometimes for the muscles to deactivate. And this is actually the end of the hold. Gently pressing yourself up, walking the hands back towards your hips. Maybe even doing a little twist towards one side, the other side. Removing any props out. And then Veronica is going to take us through the next portion of class. All right. Okay, so our next pose is we're actually going to come up beginning in a tabletop. So let's get in the tabletop position. Joints stacked under the other wrists, under shoulders, knees, under hips. And kind of see what this feels like for you today. Maybe you move through some flexion and extension of the spine. We just did a lot of forward folding. So 
lifting the head up and down, moving it in that direction might feel good. And then we're gonna get settled and we're gonna go into dragon or baby dragon, whatever you want today. So uh, in vinyasa, it is a low lunge anjaniyasana. We're gonna start with bringing the left foot forward and having the right knee back. Now immediately, if your right knee is like, no, I cannot meet this, I'm already at my edge, pat it roll up the mat. I pers Even though my knee is in screaming, I'm still going to pat it because I know that's going to help me through uh, this pose. And then you have a couple options here. You can stay with your hands on either side of your left foot and really just sink into this hip right here. Or what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my left foot a little bit out to take my left hand on the inside, so kind of like a lizard. And then two hands in here. Whatever feels good. The reason I'm taking mine's a little bit out is because I feel a little pinching in the top of my hip, of my left hip. And to avoid that, I've noticed bringing it out helps alleviate that. So if that's true for you, and that'll help you hold for time, please do so. We're not gonna be in this long. If you're really bending, you can go down to your forearms. But bringing it back to the hamstring and kind of this idea of yin and yang. So we're, we're really working into our right quadricep now. And that's kind of feeling like the yang um, and the so as in the front of the hip. But if we bring our attention to our hamstrings right now, they are completely relaxed. They're actually the yin right now. Um, when they were, you know, just two poses ago in that shoelace that Greta had us in for a nice long, I think it was, I think a six minute hold. Our hamstrings are definitely the yang. They were definitely the fire, but Right now, to maybe take away of the fire that's going on in the quad, we can think about the cooler, relaxed state of the hamstring right now in our right leg. And this is our halfway point. Another thing um, a teacher told me recently about yin and yang is that once you start realizing that it exists, you start seeing it in everything, whether it be driving a car, pressing on the gas, and then pressing on the brake, you kind of realize that everything exists with just a system of balance. You can't always press on the gas because be, you're going to drive into something. And you can't always be on the brake because you're never going to go anywhere. So it exists in everything. And once you start noticing it or looking for it and the things you come in on your daily life, you begin to see that there's just a little balance, a little yin, a little yang, yin, a little yang in everything. All right, it's moving slowly. I like to come back up on this knee and just immediately go into a little cat forward stretch. Maybe go back to a tabletop position. 
And give yourself a couple more cat cows or any counter movements. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, switch over to the next leg. So moving the pillow or the blanket you had to underneath the left knee, stacked in this tabletop and bring the right foot forward. And we're gonna lean forward as much as we can until we meet our edge to bring a nice stretch to that left um, quadricep. And again, each side is different. So you might have your hands on both sides or again, if there's that pinching, you can move your foot a little bit out and have it more like a lizard lunge. We'll hold for time. This is our halfway point. Only about 30 more seconds. Remembering to breathe. All right. Slowly push back to relieve that left hip flexor. Taking any stretch that feels good, maybe bringing back to a tabletop for just a few more cat cows. And make your way down to child's pose. Feel free to make this comfy and supportive if you want. Um, I've been lately resting my head on a block or you can do it on a pillow. You maybe wanna experiment with a closed leg child's pose or wide leg child's pose, whatever fits you today. But whatever it is, go ahead and find your way into it. This is our grounding pose as we're coming to the end of this sequence. We've only got a few more holds left. And we'll be in this for four minutes.
this is our halfway point. I always notice that in child's pose, I don't know if it's because I do it a lot or it's, it's relatively easy and familiar to me at this point, but my mind always wonders. It's like the pose that I plan my day in. <laughs> um, but if you see that happening, that's okay. You know, that'll happen today and that'll happen tomorrow. The whole point of yoga and the whole point of this practice is to move in and out of meditation. So when we see our mind wandering, we bring it back to our breath. Or we bring it back to the shape of our body. We can even bring it back to almost a bird's eye view of the body. Kind of looking and scanning over everything, starting from where our fingertips are. Moving up to our head, pressing against the ground or a block, to our neck relaxing to the traction in our shoulders, and the traction going on in our spine and our hips. All right, moving slowly, come back out of child's pose. And we'll meet in a tabletop whenever you're ready. And since I've seen everyone in class before, um, I'm guessing we're all yogis. So let's kind of move here on our own time, but we're gonna go into a uh, half pigeon starting with the right leg, maybe bring it out long or maybe even do a down dog, you know. Bringing the right leg forward parallel to the top of the mat. If there is a pinching in the front of the hip, simply move the foot closer in. Don't make it such a parallel. You can use a block to support your outer hip. You could use, if this is too much on the knee, you can take pigeon on the back, which would look like this. Lying on your back and grabbing for the left leg. This is our halfway point.
final minute. Taking one last deep breath in and exhale into that hip. Go ahead and press yourself up. Maybe take a down dog, paddle it out and go ahead and move to the left, bringing the left shin forward, parallel to the front of the mat. Adding any props, any pillows, any blankets. Maybe taking this side on your back. But go ahead and lower down into that. We'll be here for another three minutes. our halfway point. If the pose is calling you in deeper, feel free to go there. slowly pressing back up, coming out of the pose. Doing whatever counter stretch feels good and then making our way to our backs. 
for our final twist before Shavasana. So take whatever twist feels good. I'm going to pull my knees in and then just simply drop both knees off to the left. Simple supine spinal twist. Rinsing the spine and also relaxing it on the mat. We did a lot of forward bending in this sequence today, so kind of relishing in the fact that oh, we can relax on the spine now. And moving the knees back to center. Take this twist on the opposite side, dropping them off to the right. Left arm can be out long if that feels good. Head can fall either to the right, to the left, or just be neutral on the mat. And bringing the knees back up and extending them out for the final and possibly most rewarding and important pose, Shavasana. Get, yeah, I see blankets coming out. And for Shavasana, we'll let you know when it's time to come up and out of the practice. So in the quiet and the stillness you've created, tapping into the spaciousness that comes along with that. And noticing with that space, it requ requires us to relax to uh, relax the fixations we often carry in our minds and the material and the substance that's going on there. So releasing that, letting that go, and really just kind of being there with that, that space and practicing awareness, suspending the judgment and diving into it with curiosity.
And then slowly begin to invite gentle movement back into your body. You might be wiggling of the fingers, balancing of the shoulders. You might want to expand and scrunch your face. And bring the arms overhead like you would stretch if you were in a cartoon waking up. And bring knees in towards your chest. And choose if you'd like to roll over onto the right or the left side. Left definitely being more associated with the, the yin qualities you are cultivating. Also associated with a lot of the lunar qualities. Using the bicep like a pillow coming into a fetal position. And taking a moment to acknowledge transition out of the practice and honoring the work that you process during this time. Uh, honoring where you are in this process and also honoring the traditions that this practice comes from. Our practice of yoga has its roots in, in India and in classic texts like the Veda and the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. But this is a yin practice and yin actually comes from a lot of Chinese medicine and Taoist theory. And so really bridging those two practices together and honoring the teachers that brought that material forward for us and honoring your teachers and the many forms they take in your life, be they actually humans, animals, experiences. And then we also like to do a land acknowledgement and Veronica is in Brooklyn. Um, I'm here in Seattle. I know we have friends in LA here. We have a friend in Colorado. And so we really are all over um, the States. And so thinking about where you are in the world and honoring the unceded ancestral lands. Here it's Duwamish in Brooklyn and Silapade, Canarsie and Rockaway people. The land we occupy is on the traditional territory of these peoples and we honor those indigenous tra traditions and also their ancestors and the people here today who work to carry those traditions forward. You can gently press yourself up to a seat and we'll meet with hands at heart center in the Anjali Mudra, which represents non-dualism. It's the coming together of balance or these oppositional forces like the yin and yang energies and tapping the thumb and really feeling its presence on heart center and bringing hands from heart center to third eye, strengthening the connection between your heart and your mind and bowing forward to sealing your practice, honoring the whole self, the full gamut of your experience, both the dark and the luminous qualities. Peace and thank you so much for being in practice today. And I hope to see you all again very soon.